This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Good afternoon. I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And it's my great honor, on behalf of all the organizers of this session, to welcome you. I'm very delighted that Hal Sox is our very special guest, and all of you to our eighth lecture series. The wish to honor John Eisenberg inspired this joint effort by individuals from several major institutions in the Bay Area. The co-organizers are Arnie Milstein from Stanford, who graciously agreed to join us this year when Alan Garber left Stanford to go to Harvard to be its provost, Steve Shortell from UC Berkeley, Hal Luft from the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Research Institute and UCSF, and myself from UCSF. For this event honoring John Eisenberg, we invited individuals who are recognized for their leadership in translating research into policy, from the research side and also from the policy side. We recognized the value of continuing to honor John's incredible legacy by bringing together individuals like many of you who continue to honor his work through your own work in being effective bridges between research and policy making. And the individual we're gonna to honor today, who you will learn a lot more about in a few minutes, exemplifies John's spirit. And not only does he engage actively in the field, but he also is inspirational to all of us. The John Eisenberg Legacy Lectureship is possible because of a very generous grant from the California Healthcare Foundation. And here to say a few words on behalf of the foundation and about John is Mark Smith, President and CEO of the foundation. Thanks, Claire, and, and welcome to everyone. I'm gonna be uncharacteristically brief. Um, the foundation, is really pleased and honored to sponsor this uh, legacy lectureship. And um, I was asked to say a few words about John Eisenberg. I first met John Eisenberg in 1985. And then in 1986, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania to be a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar, John was then the chief of general medicine at Penn. And John was uh, first a role model, frankly, and a teacher and mentor and later in our respective careers, I'm, I'm proud to say I think a colleague and a friend. Um, John was really an extraordinary person for those of you who, who knew him. He was in many ways the creator of a revolution. And um, he would smile at my quoting Lenin in his honor. Um, <laughs> but Lenin once said that revolutions are made by men who think as men of action and act as men of thought. And John was someone who thought as a man of action, but acted as a man of thought. This combining research and policy and changing the world uh, was his forte. And with Hal Sox and Bob Brook and Steve Schroeder and a few others, they created uh, the modern field of general internal medicine and health services research with the particular distinction of being physicians who were interested in studying and changing the contribution that physicians made to our healthcare system. That was one of his really distinctive contributions. I was reading not long ago a tribute to him that um, George Lundberg wrote 
and he pointed out that John wrote a paper in 1981 called Cost Containment and Changing Physician's Practice Behavior, Can the Fox Learn to Guard the Chicken Coop? <laughs> 30 years ago. Um, and the coop is still unguarded as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So John was not only prescient, um, but was um, having hung out at places like Hopkins and UCSF, you hang out with a lot of smart people. John was unquestionably one of the smartest people I have ever known and one of the hardest workers and also one of the people most committed to balance in his life and having fun. I'll never forget going to a Georgetown basketball game when Allen Iverson was playing with John and Tony Fauci was sitting one seat behind us yelling in his Queens accent, Allen! Um, <laughs> John was someone uh, whose legacy um, exists today in much of what we know as the modern um, establishment of health services research, of comparative effectiveness research, and we're all indebted to him uh, for the contributions that he made. Um, it is uh, sad to remember he died in March of 2002 at age 55. It is troubling to think that it's um, been 10 years almost since he's been gone, and also that uh, for some of us in the room, 55 is in the rearview mirror. Um, <laughs> But his contributions uh, continue, and we're pleased and honored that the three great health services research institutions in the Bay Area have found it possible to collaborate for these many years now um, on an enterprise that I think serves us all well. So thanks to Hal for giving this year's lecture. Thanks to all of you for being here. And, and, and thanks to John for his contributions. And thank you, Mark, for uh, helping the foundation bring the three organizations together. Um, I first met Hal Sox in 1973 when we were both new faculty at Stanford Medical School. Uh, he was a young assistant professor uh, in medicine. I was a young assistant professor in health services research. Uh, and um, along with Hal Holman, uh, who was then the uh, co-director, along with uh, Wally Epstein at UCSF, of the joint UCSF-Stanford Clinical Scholars Program. We had a seminar with probably about eight to 10 people and three Hal's. Um, I have walked in Hal's shadow since then. Um, many places, not at Dartmouth though. Uh, and Hal then, um, he stayed at Stanford until 1988. Uh, left as a, a full professor, went to Dartmouth, became chair of medicine, and had a long and outstanding career that continues at Dartmouth. Hal won the Robert J. Glazer Award for contributions to education and research in generalism and medicine, recognizing one piece of what Mark Smith had uh, identified. He's also, as of today, a double Eisenberg um, in 2007, he won the John M. Eisenberg Award from the Society of uh, Medical Decision Making. As examples of bringing research into policy, he's been co-chair of two, he's been on many other, but he's co-chaired two Institute of Medicine committees, one on identifying high value clinical services and also on priority setting for comparative effectiveness research. And from, from that, uh, that set the agenda uh, for the areas around comparative effectiveness research and what, what we'll be hearing from today. Hal had been president of the American College of Physicians in 98-99, and from 2001 to 2009, he was editor of the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, helping to move that journal even more towards focusing on areas of health services research broadly construed and bring in the generalist perspective. Importantly, because John Eisenberg was well recognized and well loved for his mentorship, Hal Sox has been an outstanding mentor through his career. I'll mention just a few of the people who he has been mentored, or who he mentored over the years. John Wasson, Keith Martin, Bob Neese, Kelly Skeff, Sharon Inouye, Don Redelmeyer, 
Kevin Volt, and of course, Alan Garber, um, who uh, has now gone on to Harvard. Uh, and what Hal is doing now is he's focusing on mentoring faculty at Dartmouth. Uh, and so in this next phase of his career, uh, he continues to do the mentoring, continues to uh, do the kinds of things that John Eisenberg did so well, and uh, he's now going to tell us about comparative effectiveness research. Hal Sachs. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here to see so many friends out there smiling and encouraging me to not, uh, not drop this wonderful opportunity on the floor. I'm, I'm especially pleased because I'm here doing honor to the memory of John Eisenberg. John was, I would characterize him as an incorrigible optimist and yet a realist. And he was a friend to anybody who asked. And uh, as Mark said, he was both one of the smartest people we knew, but also one of the hardest workers. So it really takes both of those. So our, our, my memory, I think all of our memories of John are, are as vivid as they were when we last saw him. Um, and I hope that my talk will do honor and reflect it, both his optimism and his realism, especially the latter. <laughs> so um, here's what we're going to divide the talk about half and half uh, between political considerations at the end uh, and at the beginning, the methods of CER, where I'll present a grand synthesis that will give everybody a headache, uh, talk quite a bit about what I consider to be the major problem confronting CER, which is confounding, and one of the major opportunities for CER, which is treatment response heterogeneity, looking for differences between patients that doctors can exploit to give them better care. So um, here's the historical background. Uh, for, for many years, 60 years at least, uh, there have been studies that have fit the definition of CER, uh, often sponsored by uh, the National Institutes of Health, and they, of which all hat would be a good example, a comparison of three active treatments uh, for hypertension. But it wasn't until 2003, during the Bush administration, uh, that uh, a program of CER emerged with uh, congressional um, appropriation of $24 million to ARC uh, to carry out a program of CER. In 2009, um, the stimulus package really raised the ante a great deal. Uh, and then in 2010, the Affordable Health Care Act um, established the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Group. Uh, Institute, which we'll refer to as PCORI hereafter. So why has there been uh, such strong support for CER? Well, that could be a topic for a whole lecture, and I'm not going to give that lecture. Um, here's one uh, reason. Uh, this is a hypothetical construct from an article by Uwe Reinhardt uh, showing that the U.S. is on the steep uh, part of the curve uh, relating the price per additional quality to the number of qualities actually provided. So a poor uh, return on the marginal uh, cost of health care in the U.S. And this uh, familiar uh, map of the United States, uh, which many people would interpret in part uh, as reflecting uh, poor translation of evidence into practice and perhaps also uh, poor evidence on many questions. So we might pause just for a minute to reflect on what it really was that led to the support for CER. And were the expectations reasonable? Um, and we might also imagine, well, how shall we measure the effect of CER? 
How would we want this to be measured? Let's now turn to a couple of uh, definitions of CER. This was the one um, uh, developed by the committee that I was part of. And I put in red uh, the key elements, the comparison of benefits and harms of alternative me methods for um, delivering di different forms of care. And in the second paragraph, the notion of uh, helping uh, different types of healthcare providers uh, to make informed decisions uh, that will improve health. Now, PCORI is still in process of, of developing its definition. It issued a preliminary definition, got something like 800 suggestions about how to make it better, and I understand they've led a contract to help <laughs> analyze that data and tell them what to do. But here's uh, what uh, PCORI uh, definition incorporates ideas that were present in, the, in several of the previous definitions. The notion of representative study populations uh, to maximize external validity. Head-to-head -head comparisons of active treatments that really matter to physicians and patients uh, making decisions. And finally, the measurement of outcomes that truly matter to patients. Now, the PCORI board has added um, uh, something else, which is a strong emphasis on patient-centeredness uh, and informed choice. And they've used the term patient-centered outcome research uh, to perhaps replace uh, CER. But the notion behind it is clearly tailoring the choice of, of treatments or tests to the needs of the patient who's in the room with a physician or clinician. So the promise of CER, this is the elevator speech, um, information to help clinicians and their patients make better decisions. Now, medical decision making, what we've just been talking about, invariably involves uh, uncertainty. And I find it useful to think of that uncertainty in two, two ways. The first is what I uh, call un inherent uncertainty. That's uncertainty that just goes with the territory. Uh, a treatment that, uh, is you re that re people respond to 50% of the time means that if you choose that treatment, you're not sure whether you're gonna respond. And that's just inherent and the characteristics of the treatment. But there's also evidence that's due, uh, there's also uncertainty that's due to the evidence itself. In other words, you're actually uncertain about how uncertain you should be, because, right? Uh, for example, the response, response rate is 50%. The data are statistically consistent with rates ranging from 40 to 60%. So that's, uh, uncertainty that's due to the evidence itself, either because of lack of precision uh, or because of potential for systematic error, which we call bias. Now, the methods uh, of CER try to reduce uncertainty by exploiting differences between patients to make it more likely that a patient will respond to a treatment. <coughs> And this uh, is the grand synthesis, which um, I'll try to lead you through. Um, so this, this uh, grand synthesis emphasizes the objective of trying to discover uh, the conditions, which means basically patient predictors, under which one treatment is preferred to another treatment. Now this left-hand box deals with the empirical basis of, uh, of making this uh, discovery, um, either by different types of randomized trials or observational studies that inevitably deal, try to deal with coping with confounding, and then models to detect heterogeneity of treatment effect. And we're gonna focus for the methodologic part of this talk on, on these items here. But this empirical data also feeds what I would call a, a virtual uh, approach 
uh, to identifying conditions in which A is preferred to B, namely a decision model where empirical data provide probabilities, uh, individual measures or patient surveys provide utilities um, that go into a model of the choice between treatments A and B. One-way sensitivity analyses over a wide range of potential values for those each variable identify the variables to which the choice between A and B is sensitive. In other words, where extreme values will change the preference from A to B. And this feeds into this process of deciding the conditions under which one treatment should be preferred to the other. The, uh, the unique uh, contribution of this side of the diagram uh, are the utilities. Uh, this is the one place where patients' preferences for the outcomes that they may experience are explicitly incorporated uh, into the process of trying to decide uh, which treatment should, they should prefer. So this is just a reminder of the definition of patient-centered outcome research. Representative study populations, head-to-head -head comparisons of active treatments uh, and outcomes that matter to patients. Now this definition really actually creates a lot of constraints uh, for what CER can do. Um, for example, the requirement to facilitate decision making uh, means getting probabilities and preferences that are representative of the commun of community practice. These are hard to obtain uh, and in general, uh, particularly retrospective uh, data collection uh, in the uh, in community practice is plagued with missing data, protocol violations, bias, imprecision, and in fact more uncertainty. So that's that's one problem. The second problem is that head-to-head -head comparisons in typical patients will generally um, generate small overall differences, which means a need for very large studies. Uh, and for that reason, it's reasonable to predict that observational research will play a large role in CER, probably especially during the first few years. So observational studies are ideal for CER, <coughs> Uh, for these reasons, and particularly because they're fast and cheap to do, which will be important for PCORI, as will become obvious later on, but it has uh, the problem of missing data and especially confounding by indication, which is really the largest hurdle uh, to, to making an unequivocal interpretation of, of the results. So confounding, therefore, reduces our confidence in the conclusions of a study such that what, a, what appears to be true isn't necessarily so. So let's talk first about confounding by indication, uh, a circumstance under which prognostic factors affect both the choice of treatment uh, and uh, the illness outcome in such a way as to make it appear that the choice of treatment is actually affecting illness outcome. Now a good example of this would be surgery versus radiation therapy for prostate cancer where physicians uh, would ordinarily choose radiation therapy for the sick, frail patient and surgery for the patient who's vigorous and can, sur can survive it. Uh, and as a result, um, uh, surgery will have a lower mortality rate than radiation therapy, uh, which in fact may or may not be true, but uh, at least will be misled because uh, the characteristics of the patient uh, affected both the choice of therapy and illness and could affect illness outcome. So how to deal with uh, confounding in observational research, this is sort of the most difficult part for you and for me as well, but let's plunge in. So uh, confounding by indication, the choice of treatment reflects prognosis. Now the prospective approach to this is to do a randomized trial, um, which will 
inevitably, if it's the studies large enough, result in an even distribution of prognostic factors between the compared groups. Uh, and this would include both known and unknown uh, prognostic factors. Uh, a second approach, which uh, um, has some legitimacy uh, in principle, is to ask doctors to choose uh, their reason uh, for, or to describe their reason for choosing a treatment. If you then grouped patients uh, by similar indications as, as uh, indicated by their doctors and then compared outcomes uh, with treatment A versus treatment B, you could probably reduce somewhat the impact of confounding by indication, simply by grouping patients by similar indications. Now, the retrospective approaches are propensity scores, sensitivity analysis, and instrumental variable, and we'll go through these briefly. So um, controlling, uh, confounding by statistical adjustment for known prognostic factors could take, one approach would be simply to put all those prognostic factors in a multivariable model that to, to predict illness outcome, and this would to the extent that it could adjust for differences between patients getting one treatment versus the other. The propensity score method, in a way, it's, it's a little bit like uh, asking the doctor why he chose a particular treatment. Uh, here, you try to model the choice of treatment uh, and then use that as a controlling variable uh, to try to get rid of confounding by indication. And it's, uh, the first step is to create a model whose dependent variable is the retreatment, the receipt of one treatment versus another, and that results in a score that reflects the probability of receiving that treatment. Then in step two, you can either use that score in a multivariable model to predict the outcome adjusting for the propensity to receive treatment, or you can stratify the population uh, by, the re by the propensity uh, to receive the treatment, which is actually probably a better approach for both theoretic reasons and practical reasons. Now, sensitivity analysis as applied to confounding is a second approach. Here you create a model for predicting an outcome. You add a variable that represents an unmeasured confounder. For example, in a, if in a study you didn't measure adherence to therapy, you could stick in a variable that would represent uh, adherence to therapy, then v v vary the value of that variable over a wide range and see whether, uh, whether the model changes as a result of uh, varying the value of this unknown variable over a wide range. And if it doesn't change, then an unmeasured confounder is probably not a concern for you. Now, the third uh, approach we'll talk about, again briefly, is instrumental variable analysis, which is something that is hard to understand um, and probably best explained by somebody who's done it. But I dare say we might have difficulty, even in this room, in finding somebody who's done it. So you're going to be stuck with me. <laughs> so an instrumental variable is an external cause of the exposure, but is unrelated to the outcome, except as it affects the exposure, in other words, the treatment. The perfect instrument is randomization. It affects treatment directly, but has no relationship to outcome except as influenced by differences in the treatment. And uh, Mark McClellan uh, has written the classic instrumental variable analysis. It may be the only one ever published in a journal with an impact factor <laughs> over 10, <laughs> let alone 25. Um, his instrumental variable was the distance to travel to a hospital with high-tech cardiovascular care. And the notion is that there's, nothing, there's no intrinsic reason why the distance from a particular type of hospital should affect your, your, um, your, your survival after a myocardial infarction, except in that you might get treatment at that hospital. 
The outcome was death after MI, and the exposure was receiving high-tech cardiovascular care. And they found that, uh, that the uh, death after myocardial infarction uh, was the same whether the patient lived a long distance or a short distance, even though patients uh, who lived a short distance were much more likely to receive the high-tech cardiovascular care. But because the instrumental variable um, was un presumably unrelated to prognosis, they were able to draw a fairly strong conclusion. It's a very serious paper. It's really hard to get through, uh, and, and it illustrates the difficulty of doing this analysis really well. So what instrumental variable analysis does is to exploit random phenomena, uh, random phenomena as they occur in, nation, in nature uh, to assimilate a, a randomized experiment. So an instrumental variable, therefore, represents a natural randomization process rather than the physical randomization process of drawing um, the patient's assignment from a sealed envelope. Now, in a typical randomized trial, a subject gets assigned to either a 100% or 0% chance of getting therapy in these natural experiments of instrumental variable analysis. The intra the instrumental variable divides the population into two subgroups that have different chances of getting the intervention, but seldom would it be 100% or 0%, be somewhere in between. <clears throat> so this just reminds us of our confounding by indication uh, relationship of prognosis to cho choice of treatment and illness outcome. And this slide, which is kindly uh, contributed by Alan Brookhart, who's one of the thought leaders in this area, shows the instrumental variable, which by assumption is not related to prognostic factors, and therefore prognostic factors can't uh, influence the choice of treatment, and by assumption it's not related to illness outcome. And so under these circumstances, uh, one can draw a fairly strong conclusion about the relationship between the treatment received and illness outcome. And this just reminds us that the same thing really applies to a typical randomized trial. So to summarize uh, instrumental variables, uh, the uh, approach, it's a potentially powerful approach to create similar comparison groups by using natural experiments. It's probably best for ruling out a causal relationship rather than ruling one in, and the really tough thing is to show rigorously that the, in, the instrumental variable is independent of the outcome, and that's the part of Mark's paper that made it so difficult uh, to read. And why are there so few of these? Maybe because there are so few people as smart as Mark McClellan. <laughs> so uh, an important question for us, a really serious question. Will policymakers accept evidence from observational studies? Something we hopefully some people will have opinions about in the question period. So. There's some questions then about these methods we ought to ask. First, observational data clearly have a large advantage for comparative effectiveness research. We've talked about that. But because of residual confounding, the methods lead some uncertainty about whether the conclusion of the study is really true. And the question is, will these measures affect decision makers? Will they be convinced of their validity? Will they be sufficiently transparent that they can really be convinced? Who are the decision makers? Congress? Is Congress going to read Mark's paper? Probably not. Uh, policy makers? Maybe. And clinicians and patients? Probably not. So who should we be aiming uh, the conclusions from an observational study? What type of decision maker? And a really important question that we have, don't think about very much, how much certainty that an effect is true do we need to make a decision?
Now, remember that CER, PCOR is about exploiting differences between patients to optimize their care. So that brings us to a brief consideration of treatment response heterogeneity. So patient-centered, suppose a randomized trial showed that 60% of the patients assigned to A got better and 50% of those assigned to B got better. Lacking any additional knowledge about the patient except that they met the criteria for being in the trial, you should always choose A if you're a betting person. But is it possible that some patients would have actually done better on B than A? And that's the question that treatment response heterogeneity searches look for. Can we identify them in advance so that we can uh, uh, decide which patient should be getting what might be considered to be the counterintuitive choice of therapy? So let's give a, a brief example of, uh, of a comparative effectiveness study done in the 1970s. Um, this is the VA cooperative study of bypass surgery versus medical management for chronic stable angina. Uh, the, the author started out by, um, by creating um, a four variable prediction rule uh, for five year mortality from coronary vascular disease. They then applied this rule to each patient randomized uh, in the study and they grouped these patients into tertiles based on similar five-year predicted risks, high, medium, and low. They then compared mortality in the surgical versus the medical patients in each of these risk groups. And this is the focus on these three panels. The closed circles uh, are a surgery, open circles are medicine, and you can see that in the high-risk group, Surgery, the patients did much better with surgery. It was a toss-up in the middle tercile. And in the lower tercile, patients on medical therapy actually did better than patients on surgery. So clearly, heterogeneity of treatment effect as a function of uh, the patient's uh, long-term <coughs> risk of dying of cardiovascular disease. Now, the search for treatment response heterogeneity um, uh, is, uh, starts with, the, uh, with uh, a strong evidence-based biological rationale for the effect. It's almost like the prior odds of it being true based on the biological possibility of it being true. They, you then use multivariable modeling in which the dependent variable is the outcome of, of uh, illness. The predictor variables are first moderating variables, that is, variables that are likely to moderate the effect of treatment, the treatment, and then also interaction terms with treatment uh, times the moderating variables. Now, these are exploratory analyses. They should be treated with caution. They should be thought of as hypothesis generating. So in summary, with treatment response heterogeneity, seeking it uh, will be a prime goal of CER since it's an empirical basis for individualized decision making. Acting on subgroups, however, requires some discretion. Uh, targeting a treatment to patients with the defining characteristic of a responsive subgroup is okay uh, because the randomization is preserved uh, in subgroup analyses. So if, um, if the defining characteristic of a responsive subgroup was being on another treatment, um, you, could, you could target the patients um, who, who were on that treatment, but to try to modify the characteristic uh, by starting patients on that treatment would, would not necessarily work because uh, the, uh, the defining characteristic uh, was, not, was not randomized. So uh, just a couple of examples to pound this point home. Uh, old way, A and B are equivalent, use your judgment. New way, A and B are equivalent overall, but patients with X, Y, and Z are more likely to respond to A. 
Uh, second example, old way is better than B, use A. New way, A is better than B overall, but patients with X, Y, and Z do better with B. So that's, that's what we're talking about, a key element of comparative effectiveness research. So now we head to the second part of the talk, which is a broad consideration of political and other factors uh, that will influence the success of CER. So CER and the federal government, uh, ARC, CER is well established, funding is stable at about $25 million. In addition, the uh, uh, Affordable, Health Care, uh, Affordable Care Act uh, has a proviso that ARC will get 16% of the funds made available to PCORI. And as we'll get to in a minute, these are funds that are not going to be subject to congressional annual approval. NIH funds large CER trials but has no CER program or line item in the budget. And finally, PCORI, established by, by, by Congress in the Affordable Care Act, a public-private organization uh, and definitely in startup mode. Now, PCORI funding, really important. Um, the Affordable Care Act establishes the PCORI, PCORI Trust Fund. Government and private insurance will pay a tax on each insured life, first $1 and then $2 for insured life. And the estimated annual funding by 2014 uh, will be $500 million, which is a lot of money for folks like the folks in this room. And it's not a, a, a subject to annual congressional approval. So that's all the good news. The bad news is that um, at midnight, uh, the, the carriage comes. No amounts shall be available for expenditure from the trust fund after September. September 30th, 2019, unless Congressional, uh, Congress re, re, uh, renews the program. So that's going to be a recurring theme during this part of the talk. So what does PCORI do? It sets research priorities, probably using processes like the ones that our committee used. It establishes something called the research project agenda, which is a very important term that we'll come back to in a minute. They fund research, both primary research and also systematic reviews. They set standards for CER research methods. They peer review the CER results that they funded, and then they post them uh, on, this, on the PCORI website. So that's what they do. Now, we've all heard of investigator-initiated research, so the term sponsored initiated research is perhaps unfamiliar, but probably pretty self-explanatory. It's basically what PCORI is going to be doing. It's going to do it because it's in the law. The sponsor sets priorities for research questions to address. The sponsor develops a research project agenda and issues an RFA which is really this research project agenda is a package of research projects that fit within that year's budget. They, PCORI will get expert advice on the choice of study design and the RFA for a particular topic uh, will, uh, will specify the project design. The uh, proposals will be peer reviewed and uh, the relationship will be a contract. Now, this has implications for researchers. Um, researchers will be in what I consider to be a reactive mode. Uh, PCORI will um, issue a funding announcement, and there'll be a couple months to get your grant proposal in, which means there's going to be a premium on readiness and speed. Having a core research group ready to move quickly, quick, act, quick access to content experts, quick access to appropriate study sites that will be broadly representative, uh, and ex excellent institutional administrative support. So I think it's almost certain this is the way it's going to work. 
and it's to the advantage of everybody to know that. Now there's implications for PCORI as well. Um, setting the PCORI research agenda will be a high stakes exercise in strategic thinking. Congress will judge PCORI by whether CER results have changed practice and PCORI therefore will need to pick projects that be completed quickly, are likely to impact patient care quickly, and therefore I predict that observational research and trials with a relatively short-term follow-up are likely to dominate the first research project agenda. Now the uptake of CER results into practice is often, uh, but not always, practice changes slowly. It's not entirely true, but it's generally true. But Corey is gonna have to demonstrate that patient-centered outcome research is important to healthcare uh, by the time that the carriage comes. Uh, so, good question. Does the medical profession hold the future of CER in its hands? And in what practice context will the fate of CER be decided? Now the practice context is a changing world of practice. And in the next few uh, slides I'll ask the question, what is the role of education and professionalism in adapting to it and therefore perhaps facilitating the uptake of CER results into practice? So the practice world of the future probably be familiar to all of us. You will be at risk for costs of care, will be salaried, which is a strong trend. A, a lean style of practice will be uh, more desirable than having a high paying, high reimbursable uh, technology to work with. Uh, they'll, but there'll be more costly and more effective technologies coming on the market all the time just to make things more difficult for us. Patients will be better informed and concerned about their increasing share of the costs of their health care. And finally, there'll be shared decision making, whereby patients will be actively involved in decisions relating to their care. <clears throat> now, the, the background for taking into account appropriate distribution of resources uh, is the Charter for Professionalism, which was issued uh, early in the last decade. And the really notable thing in this slide is that all of these characteristics of professionalism that we all would agree to in a minute, uh, the last one on that list is a commitment to just distribution of resources. So this now joins these as being a mark of professionalism, which is a uh, really important statement of the profession. So briefly, what are the decision-making skills that are, are going to result in uh, adherence to the evidence or not? Well, first there's diagnosis, which is the evaluation of a symptom, formulating a hypothesis. Then there's getting information, which is test selection and interpretation, for which we need to know the performance of diagnostic tests. And then there's the decision on treatment, which will be affected by shared decision making and hopefully facilitated uh, by expected utility decision modeling to help doctors and patients decide what to do. So what are our educational institutions doing to teach decision making? Uh, most of most medical schools have lectures on probabilistic reasoning and decision analysis in the first two years and then the students hit the wards and they go on their clinical clerkships and um, there's just no follow through. Uh, our teachers have variable skills in modeling clinical reasoning or a lean style of practice. They might get me or they might get somebody for whom this is just not an issue, not on their radar screen. And our medical schools arguably don't have curricular goals or accountability for building expertise in diagnosis or the use of tests and treatments. This is just not on the radar screen 
of medical schools and arguably medical residencies. It's left to chance. So one way we could do it would be to motivate the faculty. Um, and I note that uh, taxpayers through GME are funding hospitals with vast sums, but we taxpayers are not demanding accountability for educational outcomes. So perhaps as part of GME reform, Medicare should link GME funding, the amount of it, to the performance of graduates after they enter practice. Think how that would change things. <laughs> so education and professionalism, what are their roles? In the long run, they provide important grounding that will help clinicians uh, to practice thoughtfully as they cope with the new incentives of practice, to give them the background to adapt in a, in a good way. And we need leadership from the educational establishment and professional organizations. But in the short run, now thinking about PCORI and that carriage, um, PCORI should fund pilot studies of the implementation of CER results, and it should select sites in which the practice environment is conducive to making change, where the incentives are there, where the doctors have been recruited for their professionalism and their willingness to practice under those circumstances. So if I were on the PCORI board, I'd be recommending pilot studies to demonstrate that practice can change under the right circumstances and that that will solve what is otherwise an unsolvable problem. So now we're heading down the home stretch. Uh, the outlook for CER, some final thoughts. So the positives for CER are that it addresses important national priorities. We could argue about what those priorities are, but we could, everybody would have at least one or two. It informs shared decision making, which is a growing force in healthcare. It enjoys pretty broad support in the polls. Um, well, 50 percent of Republicans like the idea of getting better evidence uh, to guide their health care decisions, 70 percent of Democrats. But they, when it comes to the, the possibility that evidence might cut off access to care that they might want, then those numbers flip. <laughs> but still, I mean, this is pretty good. Uh, and finally, PCORI has experienced leadership, Joe Selby in the Bay Area, and I think it's off to a good start. Now, there are a lot of negatives. Um, in some of them we've talked about, head-to-head compar head -head comparisons will require large studies. Results that apply to community practice will mean the difficulties of community-based research. Observational studies using large data sets could be the answer, but confounding is a really tough nut to crack, and low quality data and missing data are also problems. Possible solutions. Use efficient randomized controlled designs to avoid confounding altogether. Pragmatic trials and adaptive trials, which we've not had time to talk about, uh, use the electronic medical record to gather better quality observational data. Now this will require cooperation from physicians. For example, if we're trying to um, study conf uh, patient, uh, doctor's reasons for choosing a treatment, the computer might know that they're, they're, they're studying a particular condition and, and several treatments. And when the patient has that condition and the doctor goes to order one of the tests, the computer can say, doctor, why are you choosing this treatment instead of that treatment for this condition? And then the doctor would write in a little note saying, here's why I'm doing it. Now let me get on with my work. Other possible solutions. We can do a better job of coping with confounding by indication in the way that we've just described, and by more and more refinement of methods for dealing with confounding. And PCORI, by law, is expected to fund methodologic research for CER with, some, with that 16% share 
of the PCORI trust fund dollars. So there's reason to hope that things are gonna get better. We can learn how to make decisions with imperfect data. So this is important. Bayesian statistics, something that we all kind of get the basic idea, but it's totally opaque in, the, in, in reality, uh, really mean new endpoints for interpreting data. In the old way, you got a p-value that a result was statistically significant. Either it was or it wasn't, a kind of dichotomous result. In the new way, the Bayesian way, the result is the probability the conclusion is true, which may be updated by new information. So recognizing that decision-making is inherently uncertain, imperfect data simply compound that problem. Now, models exist for patient care decision-making under uncertainty. We're all familiar with some of those. We need models for policy-making under uncertainty. Please, won't somebody start thinking hard about this? Now, the big negative is a poor record of translating research into practice. But Corey needs some successes soon. Now, <clears throat> one of the negatives is translation, uh, regarding translation into practice is wide variation in practice has many implications, and one of them is varying adherence to the evidence. Jack Winberg and Elliot Fisher would argue better evidence is actually associated with less variation across areas of low and high Medicare spending. So things like how often you should get a pulmonary consult, or how often you should admit your patient to the ICU, or how long you should leave them in the hospital, there's no real evidence to guide these decisions, and there's wide variation in these, whereas things like uh, hip replacement, total knee uh, replacement, uh, there's relatively little variation, as is also true uh, for uh, revascularization uh, for, for angina. <clears throat> uh, another fact, fee-for-service creates per perverse incentives. Again, there's a rebuttal for this. There's a trend toward salaried practice that's not just a trend, it's kind of a stampede. Uh, there's a shifting of cost toward patients who will become increasingly prudent buyers. Accountable care organizations will probably change incentives if they become established. And with more focus on education and point of care decision support, uh, we could really accomplish quite a lot. Modeling of professionalism, better teaching, and electronic medical record that provides decision support and simply better knowledge about what things cost. The biggest negative, of course, is politics. The economy, the Supreme Court next year, the presidential election next year and beyond, the Senate election next year and beyond, and the U.S. Congress and its composition and its ability to address questions in a clear-headed manner in 2019. <laughs> Don't all laugh. <laughs> so the bottom line of my talk, uh, CER and PCORI has little time in which to show its value to a skeptical Congress and a divided electorate. Thank you. Thank you.